writing about gender and sexuality in pre-modern cultures serves as a lesson in humility. As few fields of study so completely expose the dominant concerns of the times or the biases of the investigator. Modern sexual cultures are in a constant state of flux, and as a result, theories of sex and gender and histories of sexuality are particularly volatile. <clears throat> like the clothes we wear, the markers of time only emerge when the moment has passed. The biases, assumptions, predilections and prejudices, not only characteristic of the period, but specific to the investigator, become visible as the moment recedes into history. The subject of sex and gender in the cultures of ancient Mesopotamia poses a specialized problem. From the time of Herodotus <coughs> and biblical authors, commentators have been drawn to the image of Babylon. Fixed in scholarly and cultural imagination, and as old as history itself, more or less, is the association of Babylon with unbridled sexuality. Babylon is our erotic other, always outside the norm. It is an image on which to project the issues of the moment. These are stills from um, Griffith's Intolerance. And you should remember, he actually built this. This isn't generated by a computer. <laughs> it was, it, as late as the 1930s, it was still on the corner of Sunset Boulevard. The Orientalist imaginings of Western empire predate the earliest excavations of Nineveh and Babylon, but they provided fertile ground for lurid speculation when Layard's finds from Nineveh arrived at the British Museum. Mesopotamia riveted public attention. Hard to believe. Both the scholarly community and the general public were eager to know the contents of, of the cuneiform tablets and as a result, the translation of the tablets proceeded quickly. When George Smith read his translation of the flood story to the Society of Biblical Archaeology on December 3, 1872, it created a media firestorm. In 1891, German Assyriologist and theologian Alfred Jeremias introduced Gilgamesh to the continent. He was a proponent of pan-Babylonianism, a theory that saw not only mythology and literature as derived from ancient ba Babylon, but also syphilis, the plague <laughs> of the moment. And if you see the quote, um, apparently <laughs> the Lalu gave Anki Du syphilis. <coughs> the first of 12 subsequent editions of Psychopathia Sexualis appeared in 1886. Kraft Ebbing was a, found, a founding father of the field of sexology. A Viennese psychiatrist, uh, a, a Viennese psychiatrist, he began cataloging case studies of pathological sexual desires at the same time early seriologists were in the process of cataloging the British Museum's Kiyunshi <coughs> collection. The cuneiform, the cuneiform tablets from Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh. 
The first of 12 subsequent editions of Psychopathia Sexualis appeared in 1893. This was the first year that the Babel, that the first Sexomen tablets appeared in publication. This is tablet 103, uh, tablet 103 on the left, which deals with a variety of non-procreative sexual acts between a man and a female partner. Tablet 104 is a variety of sexual acts. Tablet 103 is nothing less than a Babylonian sexology which deals with heteronormativity. And tablet 104 deals with sec Mesopotamian concept of sexuality itself. In, in 1893, Kraft Ebbing expanded his introduction to include texts from Babylonia, saying it is known by the history of Babylon, Nineveh, and Rome, and also by the mysteries of life in modern capitals, that large cities are breeding places of nervousness and degenerate sensuality. It is not surprising that the sex omen tablets and the sexual passages from Gilgamesh were among the first cuneiform tablets to be identified and published. It's actually fairly easy to pick them out. The texts form a small core of data that scholars, commentators, have returned to again and again. As a result, it is possible to trace the way the same sources have been published, translated, interpreted, and theorized over the course of 140 years. Elon Block is probably the real founder of the subject of the field of sexology. A German psychiatrist and dermatologist, they were all dermatologists, uh, and a colleague of Magnus Hirschfeld proposed the science of sexual wissenschaft, sexology, and published a three-volume handbook of sexology. He felt that Kraft Ebbing was too focused on modern Western cities, so Bloch expanded his studies to include the strange sexual practices of all races and all times, claiming the Orient was the home and distribution center of vice of every sort. Um, Colingus here is the Phoenician disease. <laughs> Havelock Ellis, a reforming British sexologist, bought, brought continental sexology to Great Britain. His portrayal of Babylon focuses on the rights of women and reflects nothing so much as the burgeoning suffragette movement. Which brings us to Sigmund Freud. Freud began to publish his libido theories between 1905 and 1915. His first essay on sexuality refers to Bloch and shows that initially he had one foot firmly planted in the sexology of the past. Notice that he writes the climate and race contribute to inversion, homosexuality. As, thinking, as his thinking progressed, his work radically departed from the sexology represented by Kraft Ebbing and Havelock Ellis. 
His sexual theory was located in a theory of the dynamic unconscious. In the 1930s, as a result of Freudian theory, the subject of sexuality assumed new importance in intellectual discourse. Narrow interest in sexual pathology gave way to new interest in sexual norms, normalcy. While Freud trans, transformed the cultural landscape of the 20th century, another writer, less well-known and largely forgotten, was, was active during this time. He is the once, he was the, not, the now forgotten, but once contest, contested, contentious, Joseph McCabe, a defrocked Roman Catholic priest from Great Britain, a voluble free thinker and prolific writer. He issued numerous pamphlets on all subjects of life, especially those that had been occluded by Christian dogma. High on his list was sexual mores. McCabe's 1926 pamphlet actually represents a surprisingly sophisticated attempt to put newly translated material from the ancient Near East into a larger theory of sexual morality. And this is my favorite quote. He takes pains to refute the, the popular assumption that the ancient Near East was effeminate and an effete and lewd. Except in matters of sex, he says, phallic people, i.e. those that glorify sex, held just as strongly to their ethics as we do to ours in their religion. Babylon, he concludes, was phallic but ethical, with Assyria being a bit more ethical than Babylon. <laughs> In the wake of 1948 Kinsey Report and the trend for sexual liberation that followed World War II, both popular culture and scholarship reflected a longing to break free from conventional <coughs> restraints. Other cultures were romanticized. This is number 10, 13, and 14 on your handout. Other cultures were romanticized. They were seen to have a healthy approach to sexuality, one that was free from the crippling effects of Western rep repression. The portrayal of Mesopotamian sexual uh, attitudes accordingly underwent alterations. Although it seems unfair to separate these scholars' general characterizations of Mesopotamian sex from their meticulous textual analysis, it has to be admitted that Abling, Grayson, and Bodoro write about Mesopotamia as though the Mesopotamians were participants in the summer of love. <laughs> Wilfred Lambert on the handout is, of course, sui generis. One wonders in later years whether he would have used the term revolting. He might have. It doesn't matter if the writer is a sexologist, an Assyriologist, or popularizer, or whether the scholarship is facile or rigorous. In 140 years of discussion, not one commentator has escaped the sexual culture of his historical present. Arranged, arranged in chronological order, if you skim the handout, what emerges is less about the erotic life of Mesopotamia and quite a lot about the arc of Western sexual culture. 
Which brings me to feminist politics, gender studies, and more importantly, gender theory and methodology. Although theory is also the product of political and cultural moment, conscious theory offers a frame for assessment that is external to and broader than any single interpreter or object of interpretation. Theory provides a set of categories and a vocabulary for analyzing sources that can be used by other interpretation, other interpreters in the same or using the different material in ways that cannot possibly be anticipated. Theory is the lens which we bring to our with which the lens we bring to our sources. Gender theory was the first theory that really made its way into the Mesopotamian mainstream. Through a lens of gender st study, a whole new terrain of meaning emerged. New theory has the potential to, to highlight previously un unseen aspects of known sources that can be new, surprising, and productive. Methodology, as distinguished from theory, is what is seen through a theor theoretical lens is configured for analysis. I would argue that methodology is always in the service of a particular theory. Separated from theory, you often find what Clifford Geertz said, an analysis that shoots the fence and then draws a bullseye around the hole. <laughs> The field of transgender study and trans theory took shape under the shadow of queer studies, but it has recently become more mainstream. Like gender theory and queer theory before it, trans theory has the potential to address issues of gender, sexuality, subjectivity, and desires in ancient texts that can be new and productive. As a, I'm looking forward to the, to, the, to the presentations of both Elon Pellet and Sophus Helle. Today, scholars of sex and gender in Mesopotamia stand at a crossroad. At one hand, our work must assert the value of theory to a scholarly community that is largely resistant. On the other hand, we work in the present cultural moment of the 21st century, where issues of gender and sexuality are undergoing seismic reconfigurations. These changes are rippling through culture and will inevitably impact the way our sources are viewed, and the theoretical perspective we bring to them. If I were prudent, this is probably where I should have ended my talk. However, I would like to hazard a foray into biological materialism, even essentialism, and revisit biologist Anne Fasto Sterling's 1993 theory of five sexes. The following is over my head and above my pay grade. It is based on conversations with my collaborator and colleague Peter Morris and with my endocrinologist brother-in-law, Michael Warwick, MD. Intersex condition, people with intersex conditions have some combination of male and female genitalia, gonads, 
and chromosomes. Although Fasto Sterling mentions it, she does not include 5-alpha reductase deficiency in her discussion. There is a large medical literature on the subject dating back to the 70s, but it has seemingly escaped the notice of anthropologists, historians, and sociologists. If anyone knows otherwise, I would appreciate it being brought to my attention. Alpha reductase deficiency is an inherited condition that affects sexual development before birth and during puberty. A deficiency of dihydrotestosterone, DHT, a hormone critical for male sexual dis development, disrupts the development of external genitalia before birth. Many individuals with this condition are born with genitalia that looks female, but develops secondary sex characteristics when testes start producing testosterone in puberty. In short, it appears that little girls turn into men at puberty. It is, of course, a dramatic event. And it's been identified in the um, Dominican Republic where these people are referred to as hueva doces, balls at 12. It's, a ver it's very rare in the population at large, but incidents are noticeably increased in isolated bottleneck populations with low genetic diversity. Large families with affected members have been found in seven, several countries. The Dominican Republic and Papua, Papua New Guinea. And also, what is interesting for our purposes, it is found in Turkey, Cyprus, and Egypt. I'm sure by now you can guess where I'm going with this. That's more medical literature on the um, population. In Mesopotamia, Inanna Ishtar is famously known to change men into women and women into men. Therefore, but before one can say that Mesopotamian theology surrounding Inanna and Ishtar were responses to actual observations, a number of pieces, a number of significant pieces have to be filled in. At first, I thought this was wildly, highly, and extremely speculative. But input both from Morris and Horwath have made me think it's a hypothesis that is reasonable to pursue. It is, event, it is an event like no other. The mother goddess's castration motifs, cross-dressing, or epicene ecstatics proliferate across the world in late antiquity. The areas where these goddesses and their cults originate are the same locales where medical research has shown that the incidence of 5-alpha reductase deficiency occur more frequently than in the population at large. <coughs> and there's from us. We know intersex conditions were observed in antiquity. Horwath brought my attention to Serranos of, of Ephesus and to a reading of his work by a modern androcanologist. 
Serranus was a Greek physician from Ephesus who practiced in Alexandria and Rome and, re and wrote several treatises on obstetrics and gynecology. According to Leon, according to Leon Spiroff, in, bio, in, um, in, bi in the biographical history of endocrinology, which came out in February, I think, Serranus recorded many observations of interest to endocrinologists, commenting on the association of amenorrhea with women who were masculinized in appearance and had clitoral enlargement. Women, with the, uh, women who had this characteristics we now recognize as congenital adrenal hypoplasia, a condition that at 5 alpha reductase is frequently confused for. There are many indications that new theoretical winds are blowing in this direction. The new issue of National Geographic is an example, and I have it here if anyone hasn't seen it. At Wellesley College, a progressive woman's school in the United States, the vaginal monologues can no longer be performed. Why? It might give offense to women who don't have vaginas and to people who do who aren't women. This is the college that Hillary Clinton attended. And because it is a woman's college and ranked among the top of all liberal arts colleges in the United States, it has been a lightning rod for issues of gender. Issues of gender simmering under the surface have exploded into American politics and life in ways that have been horrifying. I found this before the election. We don't know how Trump's gender politics will play out around the globe and what the effect will be on gender stratification and gender ideology. As the last few days have shown, it's bound to influence gender patterns of global migration, childcare workers, for example. And as, a, as a unlikely as it seems at the moment, Trump politics is bound to impact the way the subject of sex and gender in the ancient Near East is studied. And as it always has, the way the sexual life of Babylon is perceived by the culture at large. This is from Intolerance again. We should remember that good theory often is the product of social protest. And that's where I'd like to end. <laughs>